Um, thank you for coming to the last session of uh, what's been a really good conference for me. I've learned a lot. Um, appreciate you sticking around uh, all this time. I uh, hope you've learned a lot as well. Um, this is the community track. So traditionally it's from members of the community who've been working with SharePoint uh, with some real world case studies. So I am going to show you some uh, real world extranets that we've developed for uh, one of our customers. Um, it's also a bit of a mixed uh, session, so uh, there'll be some diagrams for some uh, IT pros, some screenshots for the business users, and a tiny little bit of code for developers. Um, but just to get a rough idea of the, the mix of the audience, who would call themselves an IT pro? Okay, any uh, developers in the room? And uh, business users? Okay. <clears throat> so uh, my name's Angus Fraser, or Gus Fraser. Most people would call me Gus, so you can too. Uh, I run a team of about uh, 18 SharePoint and CRM consultants. Uh, we're based in the Channel Islands, so Jersey and Guernsey. Um, I've been working with SharePoint for a little while now. Um, this is Jersey, Jersey and uh, this is Guernsey. And if you're wondering where they are, it's not just so that we can show you that uh, Bing Maps have got it wrong. We're not actually part of the UK. So both Jersey and Guernsey are separate jurisdictions. And the reason this is kind of relevant and topical to extranets is because of data jurisdiction and trust. And a lot of our organizations that we work with are in the financial sector. And uh, there's no way that any, any of them would entertain putting uh, information in the cloud or customer data anyway. So the examples we're showing you are definitely on premise. Um, there'll be no mention of Office 365 uh, from now on. Um, so, uh, a brief agenda really, so um, why do we build extra nets um, and why would we want to use claims? A little bit of an intro around claims-based authentication and how that really works. Uh, some typical topologies that we're seeing that we're using with some of our customers, um, a couple of case studies and also what's new in 2013. So you will have probably seen a lot of sessions that are concentrating on 2013. Uh, you'll be glad to hear that with a bit of extra code, everything that we're doing is either on 2010 or can be done on 2010. Um, so if you've not upgraded yet, then uh, don't worry about it. Um, basically the claims underlying layer of the Windows Identity Foundation has not changed significantly. So um, there's also then Azure Access Control Services, uh, which is now free. So I'll, I'll uh, do a brief demonstration of that, how to integrate with uh, third party providers. So because it's the last session and, um, and I th because there have been probably a few buzzwords bandied around, I thought we would play SharePoint buzzword bingo. Um, we've got a few buzzwords that have been mentioned a few times. Cloud, app, uh, I'll mention them a couple, but there are a couple specific to this session and if you're at any of uh, TED sessions or, or other um, identity or security ones, you might hear identity and trust. Um, so what you need to do is record the number of times I mention these phrases. The highest number of points will win a prize. I've got a book and I have some sweets. Points mean prizes. So share points mean prizes. So um, extranets, why do we want to build extranets? Um, the primary reason that we're seeing from the financial services uh, sector and our customers in that uh, area are that um, they want to control information. So we're talking about trying to provide secure access and means of communication <coughs> with customers or partners. Uh, email by its nature is not secure and uh, putting things in Dropbox or SkyDrive and these workarounds are really not acceptable to uh, many of our many of the banks and so on when they're trying to build uh, extranets that are secure. Another, option, another reason is to provide that customer service. So we expect now to be able to communicate with uh, our suppliers uh, any time of day. I want to be able to pay my electricity bills and pay my tax. I don't want to pay my tax, but I want to pay other <laughs> things when I want to. I don't want to have to phone someone between nine and five and get on call waiting and maybe get through to the right person. So extranets again are, you can provide better customer service uh, by uh, delivering 24 by seven operations. And then we also have, <coughs> Efficiency, so some of the business processes can be initiated from that extranet, customer requesting something. Um, these business processes uh, can originate from there and you can reduce the amount of manual effort involved in those processes by automating them and uh, getting the customer or the partner involved. So why claims? Well, one of the, um, one of the main reasons is that we, we've seen is being able to delegate that authentication to a third party. And um, that's particularly important when you're thinking of exposing some of your data to a partner organization. So the partner organization might have users who need access to certain data. 
I don't know about you, but I've not encountered many organizations that have got a really robust employee take on and leaving process. Um, by that, in the leaving process, you would think they might contact all the partner organizations to say, can you disable this account, please? I don't think that ever happens. So by delegating the authentication to the partner, you're saying that when they leave that organization, they'll automatically get their access revoked from your system as well. So that is one of the, one, one of the ways that uh, we've been using claims um, to ensure that um, the right users have access even when they leave their respective organizations. The fact that we're now talking about using SAML and open standards, um, SAML 1.1, um, it, it's something that's interoperable now with more systems, so not necessarily Microsoft or SharePoint systems. Um, and also the fact that it's default now in SharePoint 2013. So the default mode is claims in SharePoint 2013. You can write some scripts if you want to to provision web applications using classical authentication, but it's, um, it's not really recommended. There are some features that really just don't work very well at all when you've got classical authentication. So it really is something that you should be looking at considering um, even in a normal web app situation, regardless of whether it's in an extranet situation or not. So what do the Romans think about claims? Well, it's not so much claims, but it's, a, it's an old problem about trust. So I don't know if anyone speaks Latin in the room. Um, any volunteers? It translates loosely as who guards the guards. So who is looking after these identities? Who is managing the people that own that or that manage that information? And I think it's relevant because these days you might trust Facebook. I, I'm not sure whether your enterprise would trust Facebook with a six character password for people to access your sense of information. But it is something to consider who you're going to trust with your identity, which providers are you going to let into your organization. In some cases, Facebook might be appropriate if it's going to be the equivalent of, say, just a traditional user password um, system. But I think it's something that really should be taken uh, carefully if you're looking at even Office 365. I did mention Office 365 again. But um, if you're considering <laughs> exposing Office 365, the default way of sharing is a live ID. Now, with your security policies allow that, then fine. But I know that some organizations would say they wouldn't actually want to trust uh, Microsoft with live IDs to access sensitive information. So um, again, it's just, uh, it's just um, important to consider trust really again. So I'm going to talk about some uh, claims-based concepts now. Identity is really the set of unique um, user-defining attributes really. So the set of claims really that define that account or that ID. We've got a claim which it could be any number of attributes that don't relate specifically to that identity, but additional properties about that particular account or identity. identity. Um, we've got an issue which is um, the STS, Secure Token Service, or ADFS, it could be. So these are, the, these are um, issuing the tokens. Um, we have a relying party or an application. So the relying party could be SharePoint itself, um, but it's essentially uh, an application that's delegated the authentication to another, uh, another entity. And we have the token itself, which in SharePoint 2010 and uh, 2013 is a SAML 1.1 uh, token. So just to try and put these terms into context of a real-world analogy, we've got, this is my, my driving license from Jersey. So we've got the uh, identity provider, which is Jersey. It's actually the Paris of St. Clement down here. But um, the, so the identity provider is something that is trusted by some organizations to prove my identity. So some airlines, for example. We then have my identity, so this is my name in this case. We also have some claims, so what kind of cars I'm allowed to drive, which um, I could then hire a certain type of car uh, based on these claims that my identity provider is saying about me. But if I'm going to catch a plane, what happens? I hand in my, or show my driver's license to the clerk, who will then compare it and see, does my name match the booking? So they're doing a mapping of the claims to the, the ticket that's been booked. Uh, and then um, once that's been booked, I can take my token, which is essentially my ticket on the right-hand side there, and I can give it to security. Security never asks me for my passport or my driver's license. They just take this token. So I can do certain things with that token without needing to worry about um, showing them my identity again. So it's a kind of a, I like the analogy because it covers the token issue. It covers the token itself. It covers some claims. And um, it kind of makes sense for me in terms of trying to explain how the claims-based model works these days in, uh, in SharePoint or in other claims-based systems. So um, 
when we're implementing our extranets with plain space authentication, um, there are a number of topologies that we've, we're seeing increasingly. We're not promoting um, the access to internal systems. So I've put some assumptions or requirements around these topologies, which are that we don't want anybody to have internal ac access to the internal systems. The extranet is definitely on either a perimeter domain or a separate domain altogether. It could be a separate physical network. Um, our customers are not letting external users into their organization on their internal farms at all. We're just not seeing that. Um, and our security guys would definitely not recommend this. So there are always firewalls be between the farms. Um, and like I mentioned, no access to the internal farm. And definitely <coughs> no data to be stored in the public cloud. Um, that's something that's a big no-no. So again, it rules out Office 365. So this is the first scenario. It's fairly straightforward to isolated farms. No, we don't know anything in one farm. Uh, we don't know anything about the other farm from, from one. So if you need access to the external farm, the extranet farm, you need separate domain credentials to get access to it. So if I'm an external user, um, I'm going to need external credentials. Now, they could be domain credentials or typically forms-based authentication. The internal farm users will not be able to get access again unless they have some form of membership, whether that might be in the, uh, the, DM, the, the DMZ domain controller, they might have an account, or it could also be forms-based authentication. This is actually the most common one that we're seeing. Um, it's, it's, it's pretty secure because nobody has ac access either using um, ADFS or AD trusts. So um, yeah, that's, that's pretty straightforward because you just build two completely separate farms. Um, you can have content publishing between the two if you're trying to do something like that, but from a collaborative point of view, it's not giving us a lot because um, the external users need to have uh, separate accounts. The second um, topology that we're seeing um, a little bit less um, than the isolated one is the using AD Trust. So this is definitely in a perimeter network where you've got the external domain um, would actually have a one-way trust with the internal domain. Um, the problem with this is that you have to open up quite a number of ports for that to work, um, typically for Kerberos, LDAP, and uh, DNS. And our security guys are a little bit unsure of whether that's a, a good idea in some situations. If you have a definite perimeter zone and a, and a DMZ or DMZ, then um, it could be something that you might decide, um, but it depends on, on the situation. Um, so the, the next scenario is one that is um, more secure, let's say, than the one-way AD trust, and that's uh, using ADFS. So um, ADFS, or Active Directory Federation Services, is actually providing that um, uh, the, the sync of, well, the usernames, the users from the internal system are then able to access the external system um, using that Active Directory Federation. So this is one where you can actually use... Um, UAG as a proxy as the firewall, or else you would probably use um, ADFS proxy itself for external users to get access to uh, the extranet farm. And you'll notice there is actually also a, um, a domain controller there as well. So ADFS sits in front of the external domain controller, but the internal users through the, um, the, the ADFS link with the extranet can gain access to it. Um, but if you want external users, you need to have a proxy of some kind. So that is typically either UAG or um, you would use the extranet, sorry, the ADFS proxy itself. Um, ADFS itself doesn't have very high uh, requirements. So you can use the default setup um, with the Windows internal database for up to 100 trusted relationships. So 100, that's quite a lot of different e external partners. Um, but for scalability, you'd always have two ADFS servers. So I've numbered them, one and two. But um, you could also back that off to a SQL cluster if you're having more than 100 um, trusted relationships, which, again, is, is quite a lot. We don't have any organizations that have got over 100 uh, trusted um, relationships or partners. So uh, just a little bit more on ADFS2. Um, this is from an excellent book, which is a free PDF download. So I've put the reference at the end. I recommend it to anybody that's interested in identity and claims. Um, it's called Claims Based Identity Second Edition. But just to give you an idea that the user will authenticate against ADFS, which masks the, the store that sits behind there. The, the store could be AD, could be Active Directory like it was in the previous topology, or it could be a, a forms-based database, it could be one of those ASP.NET DBs, it could be a custom store. So again, it's providing that layer in front and actually works similarly to the way that um, Azure ACS works. But essentially, the user authenticates against ADFS 
which gathers the, the information from the back-end system, uh, produces the token, which can then be sent to the relying party or the claims-based application. So that's just uh, pretty much the, the flow of information for ADFS2. And you can have multiple stores behind there as well, which also makes it useful um, if you're considering uh, different, um, different membership uh, structures for authenticating your users. So I'm moving on to some case studies now. Um, they were both for the states of Jersey, which, are, which is the local government for us. Um, and uh, the first one is an online citizen services portal. So we want to be able to pay our tax. No, we don't want to pay our tax, but we're allowing people to pay tax online. Um, we're allowing people to search for jobs and to search for planning applications and get notifications about changes to the uh, to, to various, uh, say, planning applications and things like that. We've got SharePoint 2010 front ends that are load balanced. Um, we've got CRM 2011 back end. So this is where, when you sign up, we're talking about using a CRM as a membership structure because we want to know about the citizens who have an account in CRM. That's Microsoft Dynamics CRM. Um, but we're using claims from the SharePoint 2010 front end. Um, we are securing all the web services with, um, uh, with certificates, and we've got that custom CRM membership provider. Um, there's some other back-end integration in terms of payment gateways, JD Edwards, a driving license system, and a, a planning database system. So the, the topology is roughly like this, um, where we've got the extranet farm. It's completely separate from the internal farm. We've got um, external domain accounts, but when users actually log in, um, they will be uh, authenticating against CRM in the back end. So there's a, I've got a sequence diagram which shows roughly what happens. So the user will make an anonymous request first of all. We don't know who they are on the first request. And the, we'll create a SAML token initially um, so that we know that, so that it's a distinct user. Um, and that, that gets represented back to the user in terms of the, the uh, fed auth cookie. The next time they might want to log in, they would send another request, which then forwards the credentials and checks a hash against the CRM backend. If it's successful, the claim gets augmented with a CRM identity. And again, that gets represented in, to the user uh, as a fed off cookie that can then get sent back and forward during the session. And we know who that user is. So uh, it's claims-based authentication with a SharePoint 2010 front end and a Microsoft Dynamics CRM backend. I've got some screenshots instead of, uh, I didn't know how well the Wi-Fi was going to work. So essentially, this is the front end. You can sign in. You can access some services without uh, logging in. So you can actually pay an invoice over here. You can do that without logging in, because we don't mind who you are if you're paying us money. You know That's uh, quite helpful. Um, with taxes, we do actually need to know who you are. So you do need to authenticate for that. Uh, but assuming you're just logging in, you would put in your email address and password. Uh, we then, you've got the option to store additional properties about yourself. These then get stored back in CRM. Um, so you've got the name, you've got your location where you live, and you can see the services down here. So the invoices, I did mention, you don't have to log in to do that. But if you do, and you're logged in, we'll have the transaction history here. So you'll be able to see what you've been paying for, um, and you also have that audit as well. You can pay your taxes. Um, don't like to do that, but you can do it here now. It makes it easier than uh, checks, which was the previous system. Um, there's a planning register. The planning register is uh, basically a, a building planning uh, system, which we've got an interface for so that you can uh, register for um, uh, building updates and people that have submitted planning permission in your area. We've got protected trees register as well. Planning notifications is when you get notified about these changes. Um, and there's a list of build again, to do with the planning system. So we've done quite a lot of work with planning. It's seen as a very, well, quite manual processes that they had previously, and we're starting to add to that. Um, in the next few months, we'll have actual planning applications as well, which is um, fairly uh, complex in terms of the variations you can have in a planning application. So this is the uh, planning applications um, side of things with the planning notifications, where I can actually specify the area that I want to be notified of any uh, planning applications that have been submitted, so or any changes. So that's quite useful because I live there and I want to know if anyone's going to be blocking out the sunlight or whatever uh, on my street. So this is one of the, it's using uh, Google Maps and we're storing, uh, well, we're looking up um, CRM for the user and then we've got the planning application in the back end which is uh, storing um, the information about coordinates and planning applications itself. And that's just all secured through some web services. Um, 
You can also pay your taxes if you want to, so you do need to put in your tax reference. And uh, at this point, we're, we're not, uh, it's not tight integration with the back-end system. We're taking payments that then get synced up uh, overnight. So, um, <laughs> so um, uh, yeah, so you can pay the type of tax, whether it's company tax or personal tax or whatever. And we do pay tax in Jersey as well. Some people get a feeling that it's uh, tax-free, but it's not. Uh, we do actually pay tax, and here's the proof. Um, so uh, the next system I'm going to show you is DVS, uh, the driver and vehicle uh, licensing system, where you can book driving tests. Um, we've reused the Citizen Portal, so um, it's a different web app, but we've got the same or very similar components in there, where we've got the SharePoint 2010 front end, uh, we've got a CRM 2011 back end, and we've got the, a custom driver licensing system. So uh, the first thing is that you can uh, put in your, your, um, your last name, your driver's number, and your postcode. And these three values will allow us to identify that you are who you say you are. Uh, once you've done that, you actually get the opportunity um, to select which exam you want to book. So James Bond logs in. He's got his driver number there. We know actually what theory tests he's passed. So then we know what kind of um, driver's license he's allowed to be able to sit. You need to pass your theory first. So if he selects the wrong one, says you need to pass your, driver theory, your theory exam first and select your driving instructor. So you can, see, um, you can see that it follows the same kind of look and feel uh, with SharePoint 2010 master page. We've used the same kind of thing. And um, you can, once you've passed your theory, you can then select this, the free slots. So assuming that I had selected a, a, um, a driving test for which I'd passed the theory, uh, we've got a calendar. Again, that's coming all from CRM. So all this data is actually CRM native data that we're just pulling through web services and presenting to the user in SharePoint. So if you're thinking about, well, why is there no data in SharePoint? There isn't actually that much at all. Um, we've got some information, but it's limited. So uh, some, of the, some of the help information and the basic pages are in SharePoint. But really, SharePoint's acting as that window for the back-end systems. And I think that's, we're seeing that's quite common with a lot of extranet scenarios because you either need to get the data into SharePoint, where it doesn't always belong unless it's a collaboration situation, um, or you need to look it up. Um, so we're looking up the source data in this case. So you can select a date. It's just a standard calendar, really, um, from CRM. And once you select a date, you can then book a slot for the test. Um, and um, yeah, and that, that's pretty much what the driver's licensing system does. So um, again, we tried to reuse the same components as much as possible in terms of SharePoint and CRM um, and the web service layer particularly. So um, we've got common classes for most of the communication between any of these. Um, there's payment integration. So because of the, um, the 3D Secure and the uh, protection for, um, well, we didn't want to go down the 3D Secure route ourselves and be uh, exposed to that risk. So it all gets passed off to a payment gateway, and, and they have to worry about uh, compliance with, uh, um, with um, 3DS and, and the other uh, industry standards. So all we do is we take the payment, go off to another page, and then when they come back again, we sync that up. So they do a post back, and we uh, store that, which uh, gets registered in the, their JD Edwards accounting system uh, later on that night. Sorry, yes, of course. Same client, exactly the same client, uh, different department. Um, yeah. Is there a reason why it wasn't uh, Good question. So we had um, an architectural debate around whether the same CRM backend system could be used for both driver licensing and for uh, citizens. So the decision was taken that we would not be able to reuse the same CRM instance or CRM organization, basically, using the same, same CRM server, uh, but it was split out from the CRM um, citizen service. So um, that was a decision that wasn't taken lightly, but it was considered that there could be distinct um, people. So you might not be a citizen dri applying for a driving license, and it was it's not integrated yet, but there is a program of work to try and have a common ID, the, the single ID for any, any person living in Jersey. So, um, yeah, it's all on shared infrastructure, though. So we're talking about the same web front ends. I think we've got four web front ends for SharePoint, um, of which two run uh, the DVS site, two run the MyGov site, um, and they have the same back-end CRM, um, CRM servers. 
but separate CRM organizations. So that's the, in, in other words, CRM instances. So um, those, those are the kind of case studies that we're, we've not been able to show some of the um, legal organizations or the financial services organizations, but the, um, there is an example that we did for a uh, law company where the CRM backend actually had augmented claims based on the uh, status of the partner organization. So they can log into the extranet and based on the CRM fields and properties, they would have access to different services. At the moment, it's fairly rudimentary, but the whole the end-to-end -end claims with a CRM backend uh, works for the um, uh, works for citizens where they all, every citizen is created equal sort of thing. So what about SharePoint 2013 claims? Um, the default, as I mentioned before, is that it's claims. So we're talking Windows claims by default, but um, it, the classic authentication is deprecated. So you do need to write some PowerShell if you want to create a classic web application. Um, it's not recommended based on the fact that uh, certain things don't work as well. Um, but if you're uh, looking at SharePoint 2013 already, one of the real benefits we, we are looking forward to getting is the distributed cache. So I don't know if anyone's used, had any claims-based systems before with sticky sessions and some of the complexities trying to make sure that the same request goes to the same web front end. Um, our developers really didn't like that uh, very much when we had some issues with load balancers and trying to ensure that we hit the same back end server or the same web front end even. Um, so that's really gonna make our lives a lot easier when we're developing these uh, situations. Um, there's dramatically improved logging as well. So when it was early days in uh, SharePoint 2010 when this uh, project was uh, started and we did have quite a lot of issues trying to debug the claims based authentication model and um, improved logging is only going to be a good thing. Uh, without claims you get no apps. So apps in my experience, I think Ted will, might be able to confirm this, but uh, no apps without claims no office web apps without claims. So you're thinking search result preview. And a lot of the net new functionality, again, I've not been to all of the, all of the areas within SharePoint 2013, but I know for sure that a lot of these features are just not gonna work with claims. I mean, it's definitely the direction that SharePoint is going. I would recommend, if you're looking at 2013 at all, to, um, to look at claims really, to concentrate on claims and try, and try and forget about Windows authentication. It can be a claim, it can still be a Windows uh, a Windows claim, but um, to yeah, it's not going to be NTLM or Kerberos. It's going to be uh, claims. So, um, just a little bit about identities in SharePoint 2013 and how they are actually represented. So you might notice or might recognise some of these things. Uh, these are basically how they're they're represented in SharePoint. And if you use Office 365, you might have seen some. I, I mentioned it again, but if you see off, if you see some of these things in Office 365, it's because it's the way that these identities are being represented. So the top one is actually forms based authentication. You can see that there's a little F there, and you get the membership provider slash user or pipe user. Um, the Windows authentication one. So this is typically what you'll probably see with internal claims in uh, SharePoint 2013. You'll see the domain slash user and you'll see that W is basically indicating that it's a Windows um, authentication account. You can then have some other ones here and um, what the interesting one I think is, well, there's a, this is a Facebook one. So this is one that I uh, set up um, using ACS. And then the bottom one here is actually an apps identity. So apps, everything has an identity. Apps need to have identities as well. So um, you'll get the GUID, you'll get a GUID, app GUID, and that's the identity of an app in SharePoint 2013. It's just the way that they're represented. Um, and it's useful to kind of see how they're sort of structured and the different formats that you'll see. So um, if you are upgrading from 2010, definitely would consider moving to claims first. And then upgrade, not upgrade, and move to claims at the same time, which is possible, but I think you're just introducing too much risk in there. I would certainly recommend uh, upgrading your 2010 farms to claims first before um, upgrading to 2013. And if you're developers and you've written any custom code that involves the Windows principle, that's not gonna work anymore if you do move to claims. So you need to upgrade that to an iClaims principle and there's, there's a, a bit of code around that where you need to refactor a little bit. Um, but if, you're, if you are doing anything like that, you would need to upgrade that code uh, before you switch to claims. Um, okay, so Azure Access Control Services, um, it's, it's not that new, but they've recently allowed, uh, announced that it's free. So as long as you have an Azure account, you can use ACS. And I think that's excellent because 
um, ACS provides this, uh, this, or this layer that helps you to manage federation with trusted parties. Um, you can integrate with ADFS or Facebook or um, Yahoo, uh, any OpenID or WS Fed provider. So I think that's quite powerful because you're managing it in one place. You don't need to actually explicitly trust those internally. You just trust the AD you just trust ACS. Um, if uh, I've taken this uh, slide from this picture from the um, MSDN documentation, um, basically you can see the identity providers on the right hand side. So the live ID through to Yahoo, Facebook, ADFS2, and OpenID. It's hosted in Azure, and you basically just set up which providers do you want to trust, and then you yourself trust ACS. Um, and it's really straightforward to set up. I mean, you can set up Facebook authentication on your SharePoint site in about half an hour, um, if you want to do it. I'm not saying it's always recommended. And um, it basically has its own STS and will issue you with tokens that you trust and you exchange X509 certificates to, uh, to build that trust. Um, and it's the easiest way, and I would say the, the best way, of providing access to external users with any of these kind of identities. I'd also say that if you're exposing your extranet to, um, to a partner organization to, who's got ADFS and who's considering trusting, you're considering trusting, that ACS is going to help you as well because it helps with that whole management piece and um, I, I, it reduces the infrastructure hardware that you might need um, and I think it's definitely something that should be considered. I'm not sure I would manage to convince all of our clients that it's a safe way of doing it even though it's, um, we're not storing customer data in the cloud, something is in the cloud and as soon as they hear that word um, they panic. So the providers I mentioned, so any WS Fed but, or OpenID provider, uh, but particularly these ones, and the demo that I'm going to show you is uh, with Facebook. So um, I'm going to switch into the demo environment to show you how that works. Okay, so um, we have Azure ACS, which basically allows you to set up your identity providers. And once you've set up your identity providers, start it by default, um, it has Windows Live ID. So that's a default identity provider for uh, ACS. You can add other ones. I added a Facebook one, but just to give you an idea, you can specify which ones uh, and it lists the same ones that I mentioned previously. So that's fairly straightforward. With the actual identity provider, you need to set up an app, so an application in Facebook, which is free. Um, so you need to put in the application ID that it gives you and a secret, uh, which is basically just a key. And uh, in this case, I've said what permissions, uh, email, so this is a comma separated list. Um, so this again, these are claims that I would be able to use from Facebook. And um, that's, once you've set up the identity provider, you need to set up the relying party. Now, that's my SharePoint application. So I've got a SharePoint application called spevo13.sharepoint.com. The token format is SAML 1.1. Um, it's not available. You can't use SAML 2.0 in any of the um, SharePoint applications. And all I need to set up is really the realm. So that's the, basically the, the domain. The return URL, where am I going to send the token once it's been uh, signed? And there's a special URL, underscore trust, which is used, and that's the same with uh, 2010, where you send the token, um, and you've got an error page in case they didn't put in their username and password correctly or whatever. Uh, and the token format, I did mention that a couple of times already, but it's SAML 1.1 is, um, is the specification, which is um, it's not backwards compatible 2.0, so you can't use that. Um, and I've got a token signing certificate, which I set up. So that's just a, a make cert request. You can create these fairly, fairly easily and um, upload your token signing certificate. One of the interesting things with this identity provider as well is the default rule group. So the, the rule here is basically my claim mapping. So if I have a look at that, you can see a number of these claims and what am, I, what am I actually doing with these. So there's an access token which Facebook issues, and I'm actually going to map that straight back to... Um, to SharePoint. I've got an email address, I've got the exp expiration, um, the name and name identifier. Now these actually need to be mapped back in 
SharePoint using PowerShell. So I'm going to show you a little bit of code to show you how that pretty much how that works. Um, so hopefully you can see some of that. Um, there is a bit of code in this, but it's not really too complicated. You're just setting up the Realm, so that maps back to the Realm we saw in ACS. You've got a sign-in URL. Now this is my distinct ACS URL. It's not a. It, it's basically uh, when you set up your Realm, your um, ACS within Azure, you're going to get a distinct URL, and within that URL, you can see certain things like the Realm is there again. So um, I've got my certificate that I want to use, and I've got my mapping. So these claims mappings map back to those claims that we just saw in ACS. So we're talking about these particular claims in ACS. And in PowerShell, we're going to say, OK, what are we going to map these to? So the incoming claim type is an access token, for example. And we're going to say that we're going to use that as an access token uh, and treat it as the same thing. And when we actually set these things up, so you can see set SP trusted identity token issuer, you can call it something. Now, I've called it Facebook. I probably should have called it ACS because ACS is deciding what identity providers I support. In this case, it's just um, it's just Facebook, but a better way of calling it would be to call it uh, Azure ACS, and then um, Azure ACS is deciding which identity providers we're supporting. So it's not, a best, not the best name, but just to give you an idea. And so when you're setting up the claims mappings, you also specify the identifier claim. So which is the claim that we're going to say is going to identify my user? So in a couple of slides ago, you saw that identity, how it's represented, and it said Facebook slash uh, Gus at techwork.com. That's basically the, um, the identifier claim. So I would run that. I'm not going to run it all now because um, I've done it before. Um, but if I log on to the browser now, and I'll show you the, um, how Facebook integration would then work. So if I log into that, uh, log on to that site, I get an option to sign in. Now, this is because the default, um, which is claims, but it's Windows authentication claims, um, was available. But I've also added this Facebook uh, authentication as well. If I select Facebook, it'll take me to Facebook, and then it will prompt me with the app. So the app is... Uh, an app that I created. It was free. It's pretty straightforward. And it just um, consists of um, that secret and the app ID so that we can authorize the user to use this authentication means. It says this app must separately ask for permission to post on your behalf. Um, you can see what information it's asking for. I could use some of this as claims. I could use some of this information if I wanted to and map these back and have even more claims and know even more about that user when we're setting up their, um, their account. So if I click on OK, um, it's taken me back to SharePoint and it's authenticated me using Facebook. That was pretty straightforward from a user's point of view. They just visit the URL. If they're logged in at Facebook already, they'll get prompted to authorize it. And if they authorize it, the request will get sent back to and, uh, and validated. And SharePoint's going to accept that user. So I can actually add a new discussion now as a Facebook user. Obviously, you need to set up the permissions so that all Facebook users have contribute or other type of permissions. So let's just uh, add a new discussion. And this is using my Facebook ID. So because I used the identifier that was the email, the identifier was the email address, uh, that's pretty much my user account set up. So that's um, how ACS works. Um, you can, it's easiest to use it if you've got to federate with some of these external providers. But one of the problems is Facebook's minimum password complexity is six characters, any six, one, two, three, four, five, six. That's not usually uh, secure enough for most of our customers to use. Um, so I would uh, use it carefully. One thing, one area we are considering using it is to just provide that unique uniqueness. So you can personalize content based. If, if you could log in, you can personalize content. So as a citizen, you would be able to log in using Facebook, not do anything secure, but at least personalize the page and personalize the services that you're interested in. Um, so not really, again, communicating uh, with any sensitive information. So um, yeah, it's pretty straightforward um, to set up. I think that would probably take 20 minutes, half an hour, to get the certificate signed and to set up ACS to integrate with SharePoint. It's really quite, um, quite powerful in that regard. Yeah. Do you have to um, develop a custom claims provider to do extra stuff? Or to not in this scenario, perhaps? Uh, yeah, so you could develop a custom claims provider if you wanted to. Um, but I think as long as you're 
Are you talking about with ACS? Or with, yeah, with ACS, right? I mean, we, we developed a custom claims provider for the, um, for the MyGov situation, um, but where ACS is already able to handle that uh, security and that authentication between those external providers, ADFS particularly is probably one that's more of a real world scenario, but it's a bit harder to set up in a demo environment. Um, and it's nice to show that Facebook's so easy to integrate. So you could create your custom claims provider. It's not, it's not that complicated, but I would um, prefer to use ADFS any time I can because um, it manages everything better. I mean, I'm, there's a, an excellent book on how to do that called uh, Programming Windows Identity Foundation. Um, I've got a link to that at the end. So um, you know, that's something that I'd uh, strongly recommend if you're interested in, in writing that yourself. Okay, so um, the, uh, this was the Facebook app. I didn't go into Facebook to show you how it is because my Facebook's a little bit of a mess. But uh, to give you an idea, you've got the app, an app ID and an app, an app secret. Um, these, this is what ACS needs to know about your application um, so that it can um, pr prompt the user with the right app when they uh, get sent to Facebook. Interestingly, though, the site URL is not my SharePoint URL. This is the ACS URL. So when I'm, um, when I'm in Facebook, I'm not saying go back to SharePoint. I'm saying go back to ACS. And ACS is going to wrap that Facebook information into a... Uh, claim and claims token that can be sent back to SharePoint, which will then decode it. So the ACS providers, I took screenshots in case we had Wi-Fi issues, uh, but this we've seen before. And um, these, this is the relying party or the application side of things. And um, you can, uh, these are the claims mappings that I, we saw as well. Now this is an interesting thing. When I look at the Facebook application through in within Facebook, it will let me see what the access log has been and what information has um, has the application um, picked up from my user profile within Facebook? So you you would be able to specify um, which claims you actually well which data you actually want to pull out from Facebook if you want to, and you'd set up those <coughs> custom claims mappings. So um, I've got some uh, references here. There's um, a guide to claims-based identity and access control. That's where. Um, that, that I strongly recommend. It's a free book. It's a free download. Uh, it's an excellent book and an introduction to identity and claims. So uh, really recommend that one. The second one that I just mentioned about uh, setting up your own custom uh, claims provider or STS if you, if you want to go down that route is uh, Programming Windows Identity Foundation. Um, so that's, uh, again, by the same, well, one of the same authors. Um, and there's some ACS code samples index as well, which um, if you're interested in programming against um, ACS and writing some more code for those custom providers, then that's where you're going to get that information from. And um, who's been counting? So um, there are some uh, bingo prizes. Uh, I've got a book and I've got some sweets. Uh, so well, how many times did I mention any of those words? Any, yeah, yeah, all together. How many? Did you count? I don't think anyone was counting. I counted like 11. 11? 30? Any, any higher? 50? Right, uh, 50. I think that's probably closest. So you get the book. Well done. Thanks for playing. And then um, who thought I didn't mention them enough? All right, there you go. Packet of sweets. So um, that book um, is the sh beginning SharePoint 2013 development. It's quite new. I think it's, it's, it is quite a book. I didn't write it, by the way, so it's just a, a nice present. And a, a packet of sweets for anyone who didn't see Haribo Sarmix, um, always a winner. Um, so, I mean, I, I, it went, went through a little bit quicker than I'd uh, planned, um, but that's okay. So we've got time for some questions. If they're really technical questions around differences between SAML 1.1 and 2.0, um, there's Ask the Experts in about 15 minutes, which I'd recommend downstairs. Uh, or I think um, uh, Ted has... Uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, so Ted definitely knows the answers to a lot of uh, any questions you might have on, on identity and, and auth and these sort of situations. Um, so... Yeah, we're done. Uh